Come and get me. Come after me, Sid. I know now he doesn't call him Stid like I first thought he did, but damn it, I still want to believe. A few weeks ago, I reviewed Beach Blast 1993, and for the last several months, the more I have been researching and reviewing shows from the year that was, the more I discover lots of great historic gold to talk about. Of course, we can't talk about the year 93 in WCW, especially that summer, without talking about one of the most iconic moments in pro wrestling history. This week on the Classic Review, we are once again deviating from the traditional pay-per-view formula and looking at Clash of the Champions. 24 from August 18th, 1993 at the Ocean Center in Daytona Beach, Florida. This show was nominated by Stephen Pegg over at patreon.com slash wrestling with regret. 8,900 folks in the Ocean Center on this night, the site of many bashes at the beach. This show scored a 3.8 rating on TBS, the highest of all the clashes since Clash 15 in 1991. You got Tony Schiavone and Jesse the Body Ventura once again calling the action here. They start the show out by announcing flying Brian Pillman is injured, won't be able to compete and defend those tag titles against the Horsemen. We get a pre-taped promo where the Blondes say, you know, tough luck to Paul Roma and Arn Anderson, maybe next time when Brian's healthy, but the Blondes are forced to defend regardless, so Lord Steven Regal takes his place. We go to that matchup now for the NWA World Tag Titles as stunning Steve and Lord Steve Regal defend against Paul Roma and Arn Anderson. The Blondes are crying conspiracy as the match is set to begin. Seeing Regal with the tag title on is an interesting sight to be sure. Match starts out with Austin and Arn trading takedowns and trading punches. Arn steals an over the top rope spot when the referee's not looking. Romo with the advantage over Stevie Riggs until Austin makes a trip and the Blondes take over. Brian Pillman with the cheating tactics on the outside. Arn gets the referee's attention. There's a roll up, but the ref is out of position. Austin is dropped with his own stun gun by Paul Roma. Referee missing the hot tag between the faces. Roma hits a big drop kick on Regal. Hell of a bump for that one. Hot tag to Arn and Austin. There's mass confusion on the apron. Sir Williams up there with a crutch, but a miscommunication between he and Austin. Arn rolls him up with the tights for the Horsemen to finally win those tag titles. I give this one three and a half stars out of five. It's a really good opening matchup, and I would put it on par with the tag title match with the Hollywood Blondes and the Horsemen that we saw a few weeks earlier at Beach Blast. I thought Regal was a really interesting placeholder in this one, but I think they left a lot in the table in terms of some interactions between Regal and the Blondes because they really didn't do much uh, character wise with each other in that one I thought but I think that besides that it was still a really cool matchup the Horsemen finally getting the big win the crowd is definitely there for it after the commercial break we see Roma and Anderson interviewed by Eric Bischoff Paul saying that Arn believed in him when others said he didn't belong in the Horsemen but now he's proven those haters wrong by becoming a champion but the Horsemen would not be champs for long though by the end of the month WCW would withdraw from the NWA, so no more NWA championships to be seen on WCW programming. Up next, Bobby Eaton taking on Two Cold Scorpio. Hell yes, let's have one of the best all-around workers in history versus one of the most innovative and exciting wrestlers of all time. Sign me up. They're plugging a contest where you can win a Z28 Camaro. More on that later. Scorpio working fast early on, but Bobby is faster. Takes down the cold man with a clothesline, throwing some nice looking punches in the corner. There's a big old flying cross body by Scorp. Scorpio goes for another cross body but gets none of it. Bobby with some mat wrestling working the arm. Too Cold comes up, hits a drop kick on the top rope followed by a dive to the outside. Just nuts. Really interesting counter out of the hip toss doing sort of an arm breaker. Never seen that before. Beautiful Bobby hits a top rope elbow but there's a kick out. Scorpio fights back, hits that beautiful 450 and wins. This one gets two and a half stars out of five for me. Another very solid matchup here. It's kind of crazy to see Bobby Eaton floating in the wind at this time in WCW since the rest of the Midnight Express left, being the singles guy. Obviously, Eaton was more well known as being a tag team wrestler, but really, his singles work, especially with guys like Scorpio, can't be denied. Well, back at the last Clash of Champions, Max Payne shot Johnny B. Bat in the face with his own bad blaster, leading to a grudge match at Beach Blast, and now we've got this matchup here. It's Mask 
Mask versus Norma Jean, that's Max Payne's guitar, as he takes on Johnny B. Bad. Payne jumps Johnny at the onset, hits some elbow drops as Jesse Ventura goes, he's ruining those feather boas, Shivani. Max rips off the mask, but there's another mask underneath. Ooh, shades of the Black Scorpion. Max working the arm, goes for the painkiller, but Johnny escapes. A little more back and forth, Max goes for a splash, but gets none of it. Johnny simply covers him after that and wins. After the match, Ventura interviews Bad at ringside, now in possession of Norma Jean, saying this week on Saturday night, he will finally unmask himself. But until then, time for some guitar lessons. I give this one a half star out of five. I sat here thinking that their match on pay-per-view was pretty mad, but this one really exceeded that one. It was over fairly quickly, not a lot to it for a match with the stakes of like Johnny B. Bad's mask over, you know, Max Payne's guitar. But folks, now it's time for the most famous edition of Flair for the Gold of all time. Ric Flair's hosting alongside Fifi the Maid. He's got special guests Sting, Davy Boy Smith, and a mystery guest for Fall Brawl. Ooh boy! Let's bring out Sting and Davy Boy in their nice matching jackets. Let's talk about war games at Fall Brawl. British Bulldog says everyone is cooking. Is that code for something? But wait, here come their opponents, Sid Vicious, Colonel Parker, and Harlem Heat. Sid and Davy Boy scream at each other for a minute, and the blocking in this scene is terrible, by the way. Sting says their partner is going to shock the world because he's none other than the Shock Master! <laughs> I told you. Oh, God. You know, Flair saying, oh God, off camera, really encapsulates the whole vibe of this segment because there is no recovering from this. It's Fred Ottman, better known as Typhoon or Tugboat. He's there in the glittery Stormtrooper helmet, crashing through the sheetrock, tripping on a two by four that was placed there, unbeknownst to him after they did a run through where there was no board, falls flat in his fucking ass, as Davy Boy, you can hear him saying off camera, and everyone's just standing there in total stunned silence for a while as as the Shockmaster just stands there looking like a goof. Then you hear the disembodied voice of the Black Scorpion, I mean the Shockmaster, of course it's Ole Anderson. He says they'll see him at the war games and at the fall brawl, but until then, ha 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 ha. <sighs> Ugh, you know, that segment, it's cringe then, it's cringe now. It has gone down as one of the worst debuts, one of the worst segments in pro wrestling history, but you can't help but laugh at it because it is so outlandish and so ridiculous. Apparently, on the day of the show, like I said, WCW really had no idea what the Shockmaster was going to look like. They knew that Fred Ottman was going to be the partner, but how are we going to gussy him up? And apparently, Jamie Angle, who was an assistant for Dusty Rhodes at the time, had to go out on the town and just find costume elements on her own just to kind of work it out and figure out a look for the Shockmaster. So they found a big coat they tore the sleeves off of. They found the Stormtrooper helmet at a Halloween shop and put glue and glitter all over it. And they said, make it work. Even if he didn't fall on his face on live TV, how was a guy with that look meant to get over, especially when you butt him up next to guys like Sting and the British Bulldog? It looked so cheesy. He would change his look a little bit in time for the pay-per-view, but by that point, the damage had already been done. Now, Fred Ottman has been able to own this faux pas and you know I would see him uh, at WrestleCon over the years with the Shockmaster helmet for a photo op and everything so clearly he has taken it in stride and it's given him a little bit of money back in his later years but yeah boy that moment there really did not do well for his career at the time and or for WCW ever. Time now for the world television title match as Paul Orndorff who successfully defended against Ron Simmons back at Beach Blast defends against Ricky the Dragon Steamboat. We're back from break and Jesse is still cracking up over the Shockmaster from the previous segment as Steamboat makes his way to the ring. And what an entrance by the Shockmaster! Tony, we're full of spectacular entrances! This match gets the Michael Buffer treatment along with the rest of these matches on tonight's show. Some nice graps going on, some holds exchange as the match is underway. Steamboat throwing his body at Orndorff, but Paul ducks and Steamboat flies to the outside. Paul fighting to keep Steamboat down. Steamboat with some double chops that send Orndorff flying over the top rope. Is that not a DQ? No, says Tony. It's the intent, not the momentum. God, I'm so sick of these nuances. Ricky with a big dive outside. Back in the ring, Orndorff goes to the cover dirty, thinks he's won and he asks for the belt. Steamboat tries to capitalize but doesn't quite do it. Paul goes for a slam but Ricky turns it into a roll up, the three count, and the win. Steamboat winning the World TV Championship once again but after the match, Orndorff jumping Ricky, hitting him with a pile driver on the stage so this feud here far from over. 
Three stars out of five for me. It's a good match. The one thing I see over and over again around this time in WCW is the constant arguing of, oh, somebody went over the top rope. Is it a DQ? Is it not a DQ? And the fact they have to explain this every single week, that would just tire me out if I were having to watch this on a weekly basis and go, I'm so sick of seeing this over the top thing and it being so ticky tack with how they enforce that rule. And by the way, where was the equalizer on this? He debuted with Orndorff weeks ago. Backstage, Eric Bischoff is with Harley Race and the masked Colossal Kongs. Race telling Ric Flair that sucker punching him was the biggest mistake of his life, and these two monsters will turn Flair and Sting into grease spots in the ring tonight. I'll go to a special tag team match here as Sting and Ric Flair team up against the Colossal Kongs, two big dudes in masks who are pushed for the very specific purpose of putting these two stars over. We get a shot of a young David Flair at ringside next to Ric's then wife Beth. As for the Colossal Kongs, their respective names are Awesome Kong and King Kong. One is a name that would be coincidentally uh, used by a female wrestler years later, and the other just seems like massive trademark infringement bait. These guys have been built up as two men who have never left their feet, and so the match starts right out the gate. Sting body slams them both. Welp, crowd loves seeing it, though. They do say on commentary that Flair is the NWA champion. The whole story is that Flair is going to defend the title against Sting this Saturday. All four men are fighting. Sting hits a couple of the drop kicks and a clothesline. And while that's all going on, Flair and Harley scrap on the outside for a bit. Sting diving onto one of the Kongs, pins to win. Flair follows up right after the bell, diving onto the other Kong. He hit one. I give it one star out of five. You know, I can't remember one distinct move that either of the Kongs did in this matchup here. There were simply bodies to be sacrificed for the stars. Easy night at the office for Sting and Flair on this night. In fact, I would say Flair had it easier because Sting did all the heavy lifting in the match. Tony Schiavone at ringside with the victors for an interview. Flair putting over Sting big, but saying that on Saturday, all bets are off. Sting gives Flair respect. Flair gives it back and says they may not be best friends, but he's one of the few men whose hand he'll shake. Well, back at Beach Blast, Dustin Rhodes and Rick Rude were in an Iron Man match to see who would win the vacant U.S. Championship. Unfortunately, it was kind of a dud ending in that one as it ended in a time limit draw. The feud over the belt between these two is still going on, but in the meantime, we have this tag team matchup here as Rick Rude and the Equalizer, there he is, takes on Rhodes and a mystery partner. So who will Dustin's partner be? Rolling up in that sleek Camaro Z28, it's Road Warrior Animal, but he is hurt at this time, so he's not actually wrestling, but it's a red herring because in comes Road Warrior Hawk. He's going to be Dustin's partner. They bring up the history the LOD has with Dusty Rhodes, so now they are rolling with his son. Hawk and the Equalizer work for a bit, though work is sort of a generous term. They do slip up badly during a neckbreaker. Equalizer tags Rude in, who mounts Hawk. Hawk standing up with Rick on his shoulders, turning into a doomsday device. The height Rude gets on that backdrop, by the way. More fighting here. We get an accidental clothesline from Equalizer to Rude. Hawk is fighting both men off powers through it, clotheslining both men out of the ring. We seem to have lost Jesse's commentary for a bit as Tony's responding to someone we can't hear. Equalizer picks up for a slam, but Hawk diving off the top rope, colliding into them, Dustin covers and gets the win. Two stars out of five for me. I thought this was a fun way to bring back the Road Warriors, and as long as the Equalizer wasn't in the ring, the wrestling itself I thought was okay. I thought the, the finish itself was also pretty good. Hawk kind of using his own body and attacking his own partner in a way to help Dustin win the match. Then the segment wraps up with a call to action to win that bitchin' Z28 Camaro in the Z to win sweepstakes. I wonder who ended up winning it. On we go now to the main event for the WCW Championship as the man called Vader takes on the British Bulldog Davy Boy Smith. Back in my Beach Blast review, I kind of erroneously said that it's a shame that the Bulldog never really got much of a singles push after he pinned Vader in that tag match at Beach Blast. Well, shut my mouth, because here he is in the main event, and it's one of the actual several matches he's going to get for the title through the end of this year. By the way, the DQ rule is waived in this matchup, so Vader can lose the belt even if he's disqualified. After the ring introductions and the commercial commercial break. The match begins, breaks out into a fight on the ramp. Bulldog suplexing Vader on the runway. Holy moly. Vader putting some knees up that allows him to come back. He's pummeling Davy in the corner. On the outside, Bulldog avoids a running attack and picks up Vader again and drops him on the barricade. Bulldog picks him up, slams him again, but we get a rope break on the cover. Vader stopping Bulldog in his tracks, hitting a big elbow drop on the inner thigh. Vader with a damn top rope splash on Davy Boy, but there's a kick out. Bulldog goes for a crucifix fix. The same move he beat Vader with a beach blast, but can't put him away. Bulldog drop kicks Vader, who's up top. Vader
Vader shrugs it off though, hits his bomb, and somehow Davy still kicks out. Vader goes off the second rope, but Bulldog catches him and slams him down, but in doing so, takes out Nick Patrick. The Patrick flop! Picks him up again, hardly race, clips the legs, Vader covers and gets the three to win and retain. The beating on Bulldog continues, and suddenly we see Cactus Jack show up. We hadn't seen him since he was lost in Cleveland, but folks, we're out of time! I'm going to give the main event here three and a half stars out of five. Easily the best match, my favorite at least, of the whole night. These two big guys still had some tricks up their sleeves uh, from what we saw at Beach Blast. Anytime you see Vader going up for anything, whether he's doing a move or taking a move, to me it's one of the most impressive things you will ever see in a wrestling matchup. But yeah, like I said, Bulldog uh, would get a couple of more title shots against Vader as the year went on, uh, on pay-per-view and on international tours, but would ultimately come up short, and by the end of the year, he would be released from WCW. Well, that was a fun way to spend two hours. My review of Clash of the Champions 24 is a B minus. Not bad for a TV special. You know, there were some matches that were better than others and some matches you'd rather forget, but I think overall it was still a very well delivered package of matches and the stories they were advancing. I thought were pretty good as well. The Shockmaster is a pro and a con because again, so bad it's good. It's one of the most abysmal like segments to have sat there, to have been part of that show if I were there and watched that live as someone who was like on the stage or something, I would have just gone pale over that. I, I, I'm sure the people in the truck and everyone around watching like could not believe what they saw. Uh, to be a fly on the wall when that segment happened, it would have been amazing. So uh, yeah, the Shockmaster, it's it's hilarious, but it's also, oh my God, lol WCW, how could they do something like that? But yeah, I think everything else though was just, again, part of the whole package. That is an historic moment in its own right, but there's also some other gems on this show as well outside of that. Well, next time on the Classic Review, we are still in the year 1993, but this one's a bit of a follow-up to a video I did last month. You might recall how I reviewed Lex Luger's time in the World Wrestling Federation. We've talked extensively about his match against Yokozuna and how it ended in a count-out finish, and you got all the balloons, the confetti, and whatnot, but there still was a whole other rest of the show to talk about. And so, on the 30th anniversary of the show, we are covering SummerSlam 1993, and that's happening next week. But until then, I'm Brian Zane, and I'll see you next time.